Hmm. Wow. There's a like, I was trying to figure out when the machine can come on. I mean, how many times have we been doing this now? Uh, since November. Uh oh, issue. Mm, all right, I don't know. Yeah. Keep going. You too. Oh, Facebook went down. Yeah, sorry, don't worry. Sorry, Facebook. Sorry, Facebooks. All right. <clears throat> Wait. Hopefully, Dave will get back up. Oh man, look at that. All right, so we'll start off today. Uh, you know, I don't know. You know, there's two big newses today, right? Yeah, well, I know the I know the biggest one. Well, I'm gonna say the biggest one anyway. What's the biggest one? Well, uh, what? The, we're giving away five thousand dollars in salt. No, no, no. The biggest That's huge. news is I found my hat. Oh, yeah, dude. I mean, it's been like three episodes, no hat. So the big news. No, yeah. So we're giving away five grand there in salt. Yeah. Sixty buckets, man. Just yeah. join the hashtag Asperger's TV group. Thirty Tropic Marin Pros, the big size, and thirty of the tra- Brightwell Neo Marine. Ship for free. Yeah. So salt. Sixty uh, liters. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> That's a lot of people I got to contact. You know, man, I didn't really do the math on it. You're like, yeah, let's give away 30 buckets of salt. And then you, like, made me look at it. I'm like, oh, my gosh, man. That's three grand. Yeah. And then, like, and uh, right yeah, and then we're like, oh, let's throw right well into it. <laughs> <laughs> we got, uh, what's today? Monday. So you got till Friday morning. It's, like, Thursday at midnight. Thursday going into Friday midnight. That's when, you cl- when, That's you when we just close it down. Thursday midnight. Uh, but you might still be able to get in towards the end early 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 morning friday so morning charlie picks early morning one of us will it's yeah, yeah. there we go we'll all see. right all right and uh for everybody else uh hopefully you guys are joining them and for everybody else uh preferred reefers we are giving away some orders like we do yeah. in the beginning of one four of these of things them. four of them four man. Of the day. all right oh i know you print them out in a different manner today what do you mean uh it's easier to read uh, yeah. it's Probably. highlighter yeah, bravo. Sometimes I'm off. All right. So first person is Billy Turpin. Uh, he got a replacement roller mat from Fleece from Thieling. $33.99. Bravo. Going back to his account. Easy peasy. Today. All right. All right Rory uh, Skopek is uh, getting his order of uh, seven pounds of uh, Pharma Soda Ash and one cartridge refill of DI Resin for uh, $35.98. He actually spent $10.50 of uh, reward points I'm last time. I'm going to get time. those back, too. Yep, give them back the yeah, whole thing. Yeah, why not? All right, right on. <laughs> Donald Portland is getting Pro Reef Salt from Tropic Marin. Oh, a little guy, though. It was uh, 42 4122 Yeah, you know, that's... The, the big ones aren't that bad. If you guys haven't watched the salt mix, uh, the salt per gallon mm-hmm. video, like... It was about it's the same. It's almost uh, across the board. I know. The big one, like, don't be weary of that price tag. The big one will last you a long time. You know what I learned out of that episode, actually? Uh. Was if you sell salt, don't sell 200 gallons because it just seems expensive. <laughs> uh, like you've priced yourself out of the market just to the fact that you put more in the bucket. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so, uh, like, it really is almost the same price as all the rest of them. Yeah. So, you know, uh, moral of the story, if you're going to sell salt, sell a 140-gallon bucket and it will look cheap. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, <laughs> not, not really, but yeah, I was, I was couldn't believe when they were like, it was like, how much was it a gallon? Forty nine cents for which one? I don't know, almost all of them. Oh, one, almost, one yeah, thing. they're right around fifty cents a gallon. I think forty nine cents a gallon. Highest was like fifty five, lowest was like forty nine or thirty or maybe thirty eight or something. Some people did call you out that you could uh, get uh, the instant you can get ocean the inst- boxes. Yeah, the two hundred gallon boxes, which is essentially forty gallons more, depending on what salinity that they're mixing uh, mixing it up to, which is like one point oh two one, which Not nobody really uses. Really? Yeah, so it's probably uh, thirty, maybe, maybe, yeah, total. But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's cheap too. I mean, little, made it a little cheaper. Good on, good on uh, people for calling you out, I guess. Yeah, true. And uh, we have a Vortec MP40 Quiet Side Assembly from Ecotech. It was seventy-eight seventy-five. Right on, man. Eighty or no, 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 eighty-eight seventy-nine. Going back to your account, bravo, man. Uh, this is going to that Brian uh, Pelworski, so of New York. Cool, awesome, man. I'll so for you guys, winner. I'll have those in there today. All right, Dave, day. did you figure out the Facebook thing? I thought I did. But thought you did? We all might right. just be with in it today. YouTube today. That's cool. That's it. Okay. And then YouTube's going to miss it. Eh? But that's all right because Facebook has already kind of seen what we're going to talk about today. Uh, well, we're doing like the same thing we did last week where, that's a good point. hey, if you're, not on a, if you're on the business Facebook page for Bulk Reef Supply, Adam, and sometimes Ryan and I suggest some, but he goes in there and he picks out like the featured threads of the day. Uh, from the hashtag Aspirs TV group, post them on the business Facebook page so you guys can kind of get a glimpse at what's happening over there, and uh, then we're going to talk about them. 
because they're right. pretty cool. So we're going to talk about the exact ones that he pulled out from last week? Yeah, same thing we did last week. All right, <laughs> solid. All right. I, I thought we pulled out separate ones of our own last week. Um, we did. Okay. I'm know. pretty certain. I think we pulled out our own little highlights, but we'll go with Adam's highlights. So, all right, man. Pill, pull them out, man. Let's start with the first one. I don't know what any of them are, to be honest. So we're just going to wing it today, and uh, we're going to find out. All right. Uh, so read that? Yeah, John. John has uh, posted a picture of a chalice that I was reading the in the comment section that he just bought this chalice. It's recovering pretty good. So, but he was really wondering uh, what is the optimum temp for a reef tank, and uh, his 75 gallons has you know some monies, some chalices, some acans, some acros, and about 10 different other kinds of like mushrooms and softies. He just wants to know what to set his tank at. All right, man. All right, so what is uh, your opinion, man, uh, the best temp for a reef tank? <laughs> I, I don't know. I think that 78 is so common across the board that uh, I don't think I've shot for anything other than 78. Where do you think 78 came from? It's got to be like the It's got to be like the, the mean. Uh, I don't know. It's got to be like the mean of the, of the oceans around the world because they all vary, like, some degrees probably. You, you know, when I was doing the temp uh, episode for uh, the hybrid series, man, it's actually the opposite. It's not. Like most of them are over 80 degrees, oh, like really? uh, 82 or whatnot. You know, and again, it depends on the depth and whatever. But right. like, you know, like most of the reefs were like over 80 degrees, hmm. right? So not many people are intentionally keeping their tanks around there. I don't know where right? 78 came from. I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. Other than 78, just seems to be what everybody's doing, and uh, we've all seen success using it. But almost universally like you ask somebody what should i set my tank to yeah. 78 78 yeah oh i mean uh we flirted with uh, higher temps uh not accidentally probably uh being like in the upper 80s 82 83 and i'm starting to get into a danger zone or zone where i'm not comfortable and there's like you can see some stress on on some of the corals whether that's because of the change from being at 78 all the time to now changing to 83 and that's stressful and versus if i just kept my tank at 83 but i don't think i want to go higher than like 82 83 ever on purpose so uh one of the things that i talked to about with josh over wwc we were talking about temperature was the fact that like really in the ocean there's all kinds of things so yeah you're running 82 degrees but you know what like uh, you have tremendous flow there. There's surging effects. They're flushing everything away. You're getting rid of the oxidants and byproducts. Mm. And like the ocean is like a, a you know, you know, pre presumably an ideal so uh, environment for this organism that yeah. evolved over a millennia to live in it. Uh, and so, you know, and you know, you know, apparently temperatures are rising in, in the in the oceans and stuff. But like what we're seeing here is. You know what? Just because it's okay at 82, it's actually okay a lot lower than that. And let's give a buffer because in the aquarium, if I start at 82, well, now the lights are hot, or the you know my heater gets or furnace gets stuck on, or you know somebody decides to crank the heat up or whatever in the house, or you know it just breaks, my air conditioner breaks. I mean, I started at the edge of where things are going to go south. Right. 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 And so you know I had to agree with them in the essence that like, hey man, like. Let's make sure that we're a little ways away from real danger, because in a home environment, we're shooting for safe, not maximum, right? Mm -hmm. And also, things at higher temperatures happen faster, right? And so almost everything happens faster biologically at right. a higher temperature. So like cyano and stuff will grow faster. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe algae grow faster. Yeah. The corals probably go faster. Uh, the fish probably uh, swim faster. Uh, yeah, well, swim, <laughs> swim faster. <laughs> Uh, the fish probably's metabolic rate probably goes yeah. up too. They're you know, producing waste faster yeah. and uh, consuming energy faster. Yeah. So, you know, it'll be it'd be really interesting to you know get to the bottom of some of those things. How do you how do you feel about the mitigating swings in the tank, like just regular old daily swings? That because I've seen you program a, a Neptune heater in the hysteresis mm -hmm. and make it so tight that uh, eventually it just wears out the energy bar from on and off cycles. But is that level of just straight, I want to stay 78 and not a tenth above or below? Uh, I mean, we don't know, right? Yeah. So I know uh, stable counts in a captive environment. Right, for sure. Yeah. Right? So, you know, the more stable it is, the uh, more better, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, like, does it really matter? 
So in the ocean, for sure, you're seeing surges. So anybody who's like dived or snorkeled or whatnot has definitely been yeah. walk, swimming around, and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you feel like a cold burst, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and so yeah, currents are coming in. They're you know uh, they're going out, or you know the tide or rip tide or whatnot. Yeah. You know, often in these reefs, all the water's coming in from the ocean, piling up on the shore, and all of a sudden it decides to you know warms up, and all of a sudden it decides to come back out. Right. So you know. I don't think that it's certainly not within one tenth of a degree uh, in, <laughs> in the ocean changing. Man, it, it's probably much I, wider than I that. I mean, over over an average, if you average like a week's worth of temperatures, it's probably pretty damn stable. You think? Oh, average, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, but if I average a five-point swing, man, one way or the other, it'll probably it'll hit be the average. middle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's why they call uh, it the average. Yeah, I don't know. So I guess my answer to this one would be 78 because 78 works. Yeah. Uh, and I know that there's other people. I've talked to some shows who are like, I just want to eliminate the uh, whole heater from the whole mix because it's just a failure point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're like, yeah, man, my tank runs at, you know, 73. So presumably the tank will run at somewhere around your room temperature, yeah. uh, which most people is like 70 degrees, and then heat up from a handful of things that are running in the in the tank, minus the evaporation uh, or evaporative cooling. Yeah. So you're probably somewhere around 74, maybe uh, or whatever. You mm -hmm. know, a after all things said and done, depending on how much equipment's on the tank. Yeah. And it's probably getting a pretty good swing from the lighting that turns on during the day and, and heats up the tank. So. I don't know, you know. Well, looking at the comments, uh, uh, most of the, everybody is chiming in with that 70, I'm seeing 76 to like 80 range. So mm -hmm. right in that same spot. It's yeah, I've definitely like at, at points tried to run 80 just because, uh, uh, you know, I thought corals would grow faster or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And that might be a good BRSTV investigates because it's super easy to do. Oh, yeah. You know, we just Control run some of them at yeah. 70 or 82, like the ocean, 80 and 78 maybe even lower at 76. And I think we can find out, you know, the answer to that question. Uh, I'm a little concerned that if we found out 82 grew them a lot faster, people would treat temp like horsepower, uh, <laughs> like more and more better. But yeah. uh, you know what? At least we're making a, an intelligent decision at yeah, that point. True. You know? As right. long as you can mitigate everything else that happens fast with higher temp, true. So yeah, like, like if you could, the there's edge, a lot right? to control when you're at those high speeds. Yep, yeah. right the edge. All right, man. Well, uh, what, I don't better. know. Victoria, above 78 in the house. Gets really humid. Uh, you know what? There's something to be said about that cool house and warm water. Uh, you know, sometimes you don't think about that stuff, man. I, actually, you know, I had those big frag tanks in my basement, which are like four by eight, and there was two of them. Yeah. And uh, humid wasn't the word. It was like a rainforest down there. <laughs> and, you know, it was only that way for like a year, but... Like, if I left it that way, I would have destroyed the house. Oh, the, yeah, the trusses, the support beams, everything. Just yeah, I kinda, mean, mm. I'm surprised there weren't, like, frogs and stuff living in there. <laughs> uh, and then, funny, funny enough, I, you know, sometimes you just don't think about things. So I went and installed a vent on the house, mm -hmm. you know, to blow air out of the basement. Yeah, and I thought that was going to be the uh, it was stupid. It didn't move. do anything. No, it did, man. Like, and so it's really obvious after the fact, right? Uh -huh. So what it did is during the summer, all of a sudden, my air conditioning couldn't keep up. Oh, yeah. Uh, like, I don't know where, man. I can't, like, keep the house cool. And, like, I just couldn't figure out why. And then one day I went and opened up the uh, closet to the jackets and just got hit in the face with heat. Yeah. Right? I'm like, wow, man. And what I was doing is just blowing the air out of the basement, created a vacuum in the house. The air needs to come back in somewhere. And it turns out uh, the easiest place yeah. for it to come back in was through the superheated attic, mm -hmm. you know, above uh, the part of the house. And there was a big crack in the ceiling in the cloak closet <laughs> where all of the hot air would pour in, you know, oh, through wow. that superheated. That was just the easiest place for it to come back in. Huh. So it did. And so when I was blowing it all out, I was heating the hell out of my house uh, in the middle of the summer. So it was terrible. Give and take. Yeah, so you got to think about that stuff. So if you're in the basement, what I really should have done is vented air in somewhere and out, and it probably would have been fine. Balance it out. And, you know, yeah. it would have been hot down there in the basement, but... Uh, I may not have made it up to the upstairs where it's being actively cooled with the air conditioner. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I learned something new every day. Good point, Victor. Uh, I won't do that again. <laughs> yeah, humidity. Uh, uh, good point. All right, what's the next one? Uh, let's grab one here. What do we got? All right, uh, read out for uh, Yeah, this was the, the cuttlefish one. It oh, looks yes. like um, it looks like his post got cut off here on, on the screenshot. But uh, basically, it was a video of Alexander has got some baby cuttlefish happening. 
And uh, he wanted to share it on Ask BRS TV, so we all got in there and said, "Oh, cool!" And if you, this is linked in the, this is linked in the, in both the Facebook business page and uh, on the Ask BRS TV. So uh, go check it out if you haven't. Baby cuttlefish. We had a cuttlefish here once didn't in the well. office, didn't we? Yeah. So I, I got a good question for you guys, and hopefully Dave can catch it. Cuttlefish, you know, responsible fish to keep or irresponsible? Because uh, these things only live like a year, right? On, like naturally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the ocean, man. They only live like less than a year. So if you get one, you know, you have no idea how long it's going to last. I think you could make the same argument about fish that live 30 years and trying to keep them in the tank. Like, is it is their average lifespan, if their average lifespan is more than a decade, is it responsible for us to keep them, uh, even though we might not be successful for more than a decade? You know, I think you get better at it, right? So, yeah. like, the first uh, yellow tang we pulled out of the ocean probably didn't live that long. Uh, now, man, they, they live 20 years. Yeah, you know? and we're captive they probably live longer yeah. in the aquarium than they do in the ocean. Right? And now like, we are. With captive breeding, that I means you have well, to nobody's trying to eat learn. Them. <laughs> you know, like, uh, in the ocean, man, everybody's like, uh, eat or get eaten. You uh-huh. know, so, I mean, granted, they're feeding somebody in that case. But, yeah, uh, yeah so, I don't know, man. I've always really been interested in cuttlefish. And somebody did bring one in once. Uh, and the local wholesaler got them in. Uh-huh. And I've always wanted to do it, but like, you know, this is kind of the thing you got to do a lot of research for. So like oh, we yeah. did the harem tank, it isn't just decide that you want to do a clown harem and like do some research about the, you know, all the places where somebody went wrong in the past, you yeah. know, and then mm-hmm. actively solve them ahead of time rather than deal with it afterward. And in this case, you can actually breed the uh, cuttlefish. I, I don't want to say easy, but like uh, it's definitely can be done. And if you breed the cuttlefish and lay their legs, man, like, you know, you're definitely creating a more sustainable solution than anything. I mean, you're expanding the you're expanding the hobby. The fun. I mean, it's fun. It's a hobby that you can explore a ton of avenues. So start breeding some things. I mean, there's diff, there's an inherent difficulty and extra time and effort. And for all of those people that breed stuff out there, you know, kudos to you because I don't have time for it. Mm-hmm. Like Chad, his yeah. entire house is dedicated to breeding fish. Mm-hmm. He does a really good job at it. Uh, they're all over the place, yeah. I comes, mean, like oh, so many tanks, floor to ceiling. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He comes here, he works. Better, he got a wife reaping. that loves that too. Uh, yeah, miracle. yeah, good for him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, the uh, cuttlefish, though, if, if some of you may not know what a cuttlefish is, so it's it's you know from the like cephalopod family, like kind of like an octopus mm-hmm. or whatnot, uh, and the, they change colors, and some of them like the flamboyant cuttlefish like change all kinds of colors. Yeah. And uh, do yourself a favor and go Google uh, or YouTube uh, the flamboyant cuttlefish. And, you know, the way that it feeds is, like, it shoots out all these colors out of his tentacles. I often call it, like, the Jimi Hendrix you. Like, it just goes up to you and just shoots colors, <laughs> you know, in your face. Are and before you, you know it, you got eaten. Yeah, are you experienced? <laughs> Bam! Uh, it's Shoot. the craziest thing, man. Huh. Uh, the wild, uh, like, it reminds me of, like, the 60s, even though I wasn't there. You know, the wild, Psych- crazy psychedelic, colors, you know, psychedelic, yeah. psychedelic cuttlefish. Yeah, I don't know. I've always wanted one. And you know, my the extent of my knowledge of cuttlefish goes to we used to keep birds when I was a kid, and you can get a cuttlefish bone gra- little thing mm. that you can put in the bird cage for them to, you know, sharpen their beaks on and grind mm. their keys. That's all I know. No, I, you see them in the in the like Asian seafood mix a lot too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, huh. Uh, I don't know. So. I personally would never start a seahorse tank because it's just too much work for me. Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, but like everybody wants those kind of species specific things. If I was gonna go species specific, cuttlefish all the way. Oh yeah. Like it's just a super 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 neat animal. It kind of like crawls around in the sand, you know. Yeah. And uh, Jimi Hendrix its prey. <laughs> Boom. You know. Uh, I don't know. That's it, cool. Got to keep its food alive though and stuff too, man. So There's, it's a process. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Actually, speaking of that, uh, we're gonna—I don't know where we're gonna put them. I think we're gonna put them in here, maybe. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, Elliot over Marine Collectors uh, picked me up. He asked me what I, uh, what I wanted for some fish, some other different ones outside of the stuff he's already gonna give us, and I told him uh, a pair of golden dwarf moray eels. Mm. Boom! He sent me a picture of them the next day. Here they are. Yeah, I don't know if we have them yet, but I think he sent them on Tuesday. So, uh, I mean, that's generally like, reef safe, right? I've had one before. Yeah, yeah, I would call it generally reef safe. You okay. know, because the eels only get about this big. It's way smaller than like a, a snowflake eel. Okay. Its mouth is really small, so like, Vibrant I mean, yellow. if it could catch something, yeah. then you know, it it would. You know, but yeah, the big antheas and tangs no and there's yeah, yeah there's no way you could get anything the clownfish there. maybe, but uh, yeah, I don't think so, man. Yeah. Although, like, I had this this 
Golden Morph, Dwarf Moray, if we eat, I don't know, many tanks it was in. And uh, for a while, I was in a 120 in the old building. And, you know, it was so hard to feed it, actually. We had to put, like, uh, in the beginning, anyway, I had to, like, spear giant mysis and oh, like, yeah. wave it around. Yeah. But eventually, what we got is a little tube. And so I would squirt the mysa shrimp down the tube, and he would swim up the tube and eat it. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. After a while, it got oh, pretty that's easy. That's cool. Uh, and, but, like, getting him to see, because they're blind, you know, they kind of feed off a sense and smell. Like, getting him to feed me was just a giant pain in the butt. Except yeah. one day we put in like two uh, three hundred dollar uh, like red hawk <laughs> or red antheas or something. Star, I forget the type of <laughs> flame antheas or something like that. Yeah, uh, and flame rass. I think that's what okay. it was. Okay, and then this thing, man, like knew it was stressed out. Shot out of the rocks, man. Bit onto it, coiled around it, wow. and just killed it immediately. I dove in there, grabbed the guy, and I like, got him off of it. And the fish was already fish dead. Fish was gone. Like, it, seconds, it was done. So, yeah, reef safe-ish. Well, I couldn't believe how blind it, but it could smell. So it could smell okay. that this fish was distressed. It could sense And it could distress. sense it in the tank exactly yeah. where it was. Man. Oh, yeah. It was amazing. That's so, cool. So, like, as sad as it was to lose a $200 fish, being there to witness it, uh, yeah, I don't know, it was pretty cool. Well, it goes back to the breeding thing we were just talking about, too, is uh, some people use these, what they, the, the coal fish, the cold fish, the ones that uh, are deformed or come out deformed are not 100% and use them as feeder fish for predatory fish mm. like that. Oh, actually, you know, this uh, chimes in right here, too. Yeah. So uh, we got uh, that uh, rainbow basslet uh, in oh, uh, the, the 160 yeah, or, yeah, not the, or the XXL 750. Yeah. And it ate all of the orchid dotty back. I didn't there. see that. Yeah, dude, it ate them all like the first night, you know. <laughs> I and I guess I feel it. a little like uh, less bad about it just because we breed all the orchid dotty backs. Chad there's, breeds there's, yeah, plenty of there's them. There's plenty yeah. of them around. And you know, uh, uh, Elliot at Marine Collectors felt super, super bad about it. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know, man. Like. The nature of it is uh, in the ocean, dude. Eat or be eaten, That's I guess. True. So, it like, happened. we try to avoid that here, but I, like, I didn't expect that to happen at all. I like, I somehow we found them all. <laughs> no, I don't know. There was a lot in there. I, I know. Oh. But I definitely feel better about the Chad's just gonna go breed some more. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. I mean, I don't feel bad for every mice shrimp that goes in. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right. All right. Oh, what's next? Let's see here. Cuttlefish, though. I, I want to. I'm gonna go. Look Some, at we're gonna do a cuttlefish series someday. Like you'll be just like the <laughs> the clownfish. Uh, the clownfish man will research the hell out of it and uh, share with the universe our success. Yeah, I wonder how many people. How many of you would like to see you know species or you know coral specific or you know these really specific type tanks type series? We've done reef tank series, a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many people would like cold NPS non photosynthetic series or maybe they want just cold water. Inhabited series. I don't uh, the nerd in me wants to do them all. I know. Uh, you know like, I don't Somewhere know. we've written down the ideas for all of these types of tank systems, too. You know, somebody told me the other day that hobbies like this, the harder it is, the more we want to do it. Oh, yeah. You know, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Yeah. Uh, especially if you can demystify it and make it not hard in the end. Yeah. Like, hey, yeah, that was hard, but actually all you need to know is these three things. Yeah, learn you by know? trial. Yeah. Trial and error. All right. All right. What else we got here? Uh, Steve Steve oh, was asking uh, so long story short he posted a picture of his tank which is 75 gallon mixed and uh, he's it says it eats NO3 and PO4 about as fast as uh, as it can let's see the, revel, uh, the levels are in zero range and blah 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 let's take a look here so basically what he's asking here is uh, should he turn the skimmer off or turn, or turn it on? So uh, is the skimmer too large because it's pulling? He's got zero nitrates, uh, zero phosphates, and um, yeah, he just wants to know if he yep. should, uh, what he should do about those. Disconnect so the skimmer? There's a lot of questions about skimmers these days. And like, you know, they were like a absolute necessary piece of equipment you know, or considered that way, you know, when I entered the hobby 15 years oh, ago, yeah. right? Like, now, a little bit more questionable. Like, uh, can you do it without, like the 293 at WWC doesn't have one, Yeah. right? Uh, everybody would say that's success, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's just advantages, right? But I'll tell you, like, uh, I'm gonna make this number up, but if it removed half of the, you know, waste in your tank, I'd be shocked. 
Oh right. yeah. I don't think it's stripping it all the way down mm. to clean, man. Like it just doesn't have the ability. Like, you know, if you think about, um, I've used this analogy a lot, but like, you know, you're essentially blowing bubbles, right? And so if you're, you know, got a teaspoon of uh, dishwashing soda in your thing, you can probably blow a lot of bubbles. If I dilute it by half, right, it's a lot harder to blow bubbles. If I dilute it by like, you know, three fourths, it's impossible. Yeah. Right? And so that's essentially those organics in there are the soap, you know, that allows it to form a bubble, mm -hmm. you know. And so as it get dwindles, it's just going to get harder and harder. And it's really, really difficult to, you know, create a skimmer that's going to effectively blow the bubbles over the entire range. Right. You know, all the time. Oh, yeah. So I don't know if I would think about the skimmer as the primary thing. You could certainly try turning it off. I mean, just leave it in place. Turn it off and, you know, see if you solve your problem. Okay. I mean, you know, no harm. Yeah, and then maybe you just maybe you find out that you or whatever else you're doing keeps up with your nitrates and phosphates, and you can just pull the skimmer all together. Yeah, not. I'll tell you though, the skimmer it plays roles that are unseen, things okay. that you just can't see, and one of them is gas exchange. Right. And so, like, I can tell you, regardless of what's going on in the tank, we can effectively pinpoint the pH, you know, super super tight by opening and closing a valve on some CO2 media feeding in the skimmer. Right. So it doesn't even matter what's happening in the room around it for the most part. I'm mm -hmm. sure there's a scenario where that isn't true, right. but uh, I haven't found one yet. And so we can just, just strip out the CO2 uh, feeding the skimmer. And there's so much air-water interface happening inside that skimmer that it rivals what's happening on the top of the tank or the top of the sump and controls the pH and the gas exchange right. entirely. So. Like, you're definitely making sure that there's proper oxygen in the water. Uh, you're normalizing CO2 levels with the atmosphere, uh, despite what's happening in your tank. And so, you know, in many so cases, actually, you know, people think about, like, if you're aerating it proper, you're going to increase the pH, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in many cases, actually, the opposite. Like, here, there's so many people breathing in the office, yeah. adding CO2 in the air. The more that you aerate it. The more we aerate it, the lower the pH yeah. goes, actually. Huh. So that's not true though on the weekends when nobody's here or you know just the warehouse some of the, like a skeleton screw uh, crew of the warehouse a couple of CS people are here on the weekends yeah. like that doesn't happen it's pH skyrockets uh, during that period you of can time. see it on the apex for sure you see yeah, every Saturday two and days Sunday. Saturdays and Sundays spike up in the eight um, uh, like eight three ranges yep. and stuff yeah and then during the week totally different so so it's yeah. got the happy benefit of which which is the happier benefit the pH control or the dissolved organic removal well you know I, I just if I could I would always run one you yeah. know and you know what I'm finding actually is some of the smaller ones are easier to manage you know so like yeah you bring up a good point there like do I need a uh, one rated for 300 gallons for my 250 mm -hmm. or or do you know do I have to match the rating or can I get away with like 150 rated on a 250 gallon tank yeah, so that's like one of those things where, you know, you think it's more better, right? Right. Uh, and, you know, more horsepower, you know, uh, is awesome. But, like, it, it isn't that case. And right. so, like, it needs to match the, you know, the application. So I get a big, huge skimmer, right? And in that case, like, if I have a lot of fish and I'm feeding a ton, it will work properly because it has a, you know, a giant neck that mm -hmm. needs to fill up this much foam before it collects a single ounce of anything. Yeah. And uh, in that case, you know, it, it probably is working really fast and efficiently at removing stuff, but as soon as the organic level drops, it like doesn't work as well. Or if I have a system that like, I have a 300 gallon system, things rated for 300 gallons, but I only have four fish in it, like it's, uh, not it's gonna probably be not gonna work at, at all. all. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And so if I get a little one, you know, one of the cool things about a little one is the neck is only about yay big, and it's only about yay tall, and it only needs to fill up two cups of foam before it starts working. Right. You know, and so uh, it may not be the most efficient. It might not process waste the fastest, uh, but they tend to work all the time. Yeah. You know, so it's always chugging along. It requires the least amount of work tweaking the thing. Mm. So I don't know. I tend to There's I tend to go that there. way. Yeah. Uh, also, you can try like reducing air on some of these things because sometimes it's just air, just too much air going through it, and you're just popping the bubbles prematurely. So mm. you can try different things. But in relation to having too too little nutrients in the tank, I just wouldn't go to the skimmer first and uh, just feed more. Uh, you know, you can do two things, man. Yeah, you can just feed just more, add put more, more fish in there. Yeah. Uh, 
Or you can just dose, you know, like trisodium phosphate or sodium nitrate directly right. to the tank if, if you think those are the things. Uh, I think I, I might try food or amino acids as, you know, a source of a whole, more holistic source of nutrition that right. will partially break down into those things uh, rather than just those two. But uh, I would look at it from a different angle than your skimmer, but you can always unplug it and just find out for your own self on your system and plug it back in if you want. For sure. Uh, we got a couple questions related to this, so... Let's see. All right. Uh, I can't get my pH over 7.6 according to my HANA pH probe. Even after calibration, I tried adding a CO2 scrubber to my skimmer intake and no avail. I keep my DAKH8 at 8.5 and 430. So when in doubt, when hmm. everything defies logic, I just don't trust the test kit or solution that I'm using. So. Uh, the Hanna pH probe. That must be a little the dipstick. The handheld red, red yep. handheld one, I think. So those little mm -hmm. dipsticks rarely uh, have the like our you know keep the probe tip moist. So like mm -hmm. you really got to think about that when you're doing it. Yeah. Uh, I might try a test kit. I might try you know. I don't mean I wouldn't really go out and buy like a, a whole, whole monitor new for standard that. standalone yeah. one. Yeah. But like that is my concern because in in your in almost almost every single case pH. Low pH, as long as your alkalinity is correct, uh, low pH is always related to the amount of carbon dioxide in the room. Yeah. Like, that is it. As long as your alkalinity is spot on, in almost every case, by that I mean like 99.9 .9 of them, like, it is related to the amount of carbon dioxide in the room, which is the amount of carbon dioxide essentially in the tank as well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the things, if you live in a house that's filled with pets and people all the time, or this is in an office where there's tons and tons of people breathing. CO2 all day. Yeah, well, one of the first things I do is just open up all the windows, mm -hmm. right? And even if it's cold for the next five hours, right? And you're or hot <laughs> or whatever, you can identify that issue, man. Look right. at a fan blowing some air in there. Yeah. If that solves your problem, it was CO2. If you're using CO2 media uh, on a scrubber in the skimmer and it doesn't work at all, mm. I don't know what to tell you. Like, uh, I've, I've seen that be. a couple of times, but like here, like we can keep it within one hundredth of a point yeah. uh, by opening and closing a solenoid, you, which would lead me to believe that it's more of the testing instrument versus like the actual. I mean, if you're running a CO2 scrubber on it, and you see no change. Yeah, like, uh, it's got to be my. I yeah, I'd question my testing apparatus. If more. you're at six point seven point six, uh, you're probably also having some metabolic health issues at that point too. Like the uh, outside of that, I'm trying to think of what would if cause it, the. If the tank see if the tank looks and seems normal, then it's uh, retest with something else. Well, yeah, I guess I'd also say if it isn't related to CO two in the air, and you have your alkalinity and, uh, spot on, mm -hmm. and it isn't related to the pH probe, there is something really major happening in the chemistry in the tank mm -hmm. that like must be coming from a specific source in the tank, and I I would really rack my brain as to find out what it is. Hmm. Uh, I might intentionally water change most of the water out to see if there's a chemistry issue in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd look at you know all the equipment, make sure you know everything's running fine. It isn't I don't know what would source would, water for oh, some man. reason if there's something in that. Yeah, I would definitely be using RODI water right. to begin with in, in every case anyway. But right. yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, that would be super tough to to answer. Like, I wonder what the answers were to that one. I didn't get a chance to read it. So uh, you know, I'm gonna go read it as soon as it's over. So you guys should read it too. Yeah, join our hashtag Aspires TV group. Find out the answer to uh, why he got six seven point six. All right. Well, next week we'll I'm, I'm gonna read this thing beforehand because I want to know. The <laughs> <coughs> All right. Uh, uh, what are a couple of questions here? Jamie was asking, uh, in a skimmerless tank, other than breaking the surface of the water, what is the best way to keep the tank oxygenated? That's it. In man. a skimmerless tank. Yeah, water circulation. <coughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, you know what? You know what's a big... And you've hit on it a couple times, too, and I think I uh, over the weekend when I was, I was answering some questions for us, we got a lot of new people over there on uh, hashtag AskBRSTV, and... You know, somebody was asking about power outage, and it might even be something that you could use in a in a regular tank that's uh, not power out. But the the air powered uh, pumps, where you feed air down into a tube, and it forces water up and over, and you get recirculation and you get aeration. So, 
Yeah, all right, well, I'm going to disagree with you on that one. <laughs> uh, so I think those are good options. You know, so like if you have a power outage, they just automatically turn on. Cheap wise, yeah. yeah Cost wise, a, a bubbler, a battery powered bubbler. They will keep yeah. things alive. Yeah. Uh, it, like it, it, fish might even gravitate to go by, be by it because they recognize where the oxygen right, is coming right. from, where they're breathing well. Uh -huh. You know, uh, and so, but like, you know, things just like you know defy logic sometimes like you think you're bubbling air into the water well yeah you are but really it's just the air water interface of that specific bubble that's like you know going up right mm -hmm. so if i take a power head and aim it at the surface i get so much right. more turnover yeah. and air water interface between the molecules of the water mm -hmm. and the surface of the area so a tiny tiny little pump just aimed at the surface of the water is going to get so much more gas exchange than, than just an air bottles. yeah mm -hmm. and you know there's ways around that like and especially if a lot of people are using like you know wood blocks or you know or pumice or whatever to spread you know, it out yeah. yeah brand new it's mm -hmm. creating a little fine mist of uh, bubbles but over time those things break down or get clogged and they become big bubbles that are not really particularly effective mm -hmm. so you know you know other than breaking the surface of the water the best way to keep the tank oxygenated i think some people might argue that like a refugium that's lit is you know pulling carbon dioxide out and then releasing oxygen back mm -hmm. into the water but I got a feeling that rate of that is probably so much slower than oh, just yeah. gas exchange yeah. from mixing in the air. But I mean, if it's a sumped, if it's a sumped tank, even may, even though it may be skimmerless, uh, I think the recirculation of the pump, of the of the return pump, and feeding it back up into the display is is another thing too. I mean, if there is no surface break or other surface uh, breaking of the surface, I don't know. Other than a non sump uh, sumpless tank, I don't know how you could not break the surface if you have a. Well, so I think you could decrease gas exchange with like lids and stuff. Oh, for sure. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, tightly fitted hood or glass uh, lids on yeah. it. You're going to reduce that. You're going to reduce so. evaporation, which is you know nice and a lot about uh, you know. I think like a 120 gallon tank can gap evaporate two gallons a day. Yeah, yeah. You know, so uh, in the, you know in the right environment, so put a glass lid on it, probably two cups. Now, that was one of the things actually with those mm. bio cubes that I really liked. Because they know. had a lid? Yeah, they had a lid on it, right? Mm. And, uh, you know, for a little, you know, thing that you're going to put in your office often, you know, it's like really, you know, sometimes it's a home tank, but often it's an office tank, you know, it's got a little stand, you put it on, they put the lid on it. And you don't even need an auto top off, man. Like, you could take two cups of water and pour it in there once a week yeah. and we're good. You <laughs> know, so it evaporates so little water when you put a lid on it, but gas exchange, Probably pretty minimal, but you also have like almost no your, fish in your those water volume things. and stuff. Yeah, and, and you know total is pretty. I mean, the, the movement of water from the back chambers to the front is probably. I think you probably don't need to be overly concerned with uh, oxygen levels unless you're going to have a lot of fish or really big fish. Okay. You know, and you know one of the things that I talked to Terrence over at, at Neptune about is that oxygen sensor that's like you know a thousand bucks or something. Yeah, 600 uh, 600 or so. bucks? Yeah. yeah okay so it's super super expensive uh -huh. and like even he will say yeah I don't know why most people would use it with the exception of somebody that has expensive big fish right oh, yeah so if you got expensive big fish and some kind of pump breaks or something that you might not know about and you want to know when the oxygen level is like going down because mm -hmm. those fish can consume it pretty fast you're talking about expensive fish that would warrant an expensive probe if you've got money for these fish, you probably you got money, money for, for these fish. Probe. You got money for these probes. That makes you sense. Know? Uh, you know, and you know, to some degree too. Like you know, people get attached to those big fish too. I mean, oh get, yeah. You get attached to all the fish in here, but oh, yeah. like you, know, you get a big fish, they recognize you. You recognize them after a while, and like they, you know, eventually, you know, like I actually, these are my pets. Yeah. You know, exactly. it's not just a fish in the tank. Yeah. You know, so. All right. All right. We got, we got any other ones in there? Uh, Clayton S. On the oh. same topic, could a skimmer be too small? Damn. Yeah. I mean, uh, if it. So if I put a little tw uh, fifty-gallon rated skimmer on this hundred and sixty-gallon tank with the bio load and everything, and the food that we feed into it, I'm probably emptying that cup cup pretty frequently. That's a good point. Too small could be not only just uh, that it's not working, or it's only taking out a portion of the overall organics. It's also getting full constantly. Oh, constantly. That little cup is just uh, <laughs> full. Like, yeah, you probably clean it three times a day. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it could be too small. Also, you know, it depends on how much, you know, you what your goal is to take out. And so, like, 
I mean, I'm not going to like go out and say this is absolutely true, but this is my general take on it these days. And there's not a lot that's known definitively about uh, skimmers, but my general take on it is a smaller skimmer requires less tuning, you know, mm. and a you know high efficiency, tons and tons of air, big skimmer, you know, has a, a ability to work better, mm. but requires more fine tuning. It's like, you know, driving, uh, you know, a Ford Focus. I could get in there and get to work in three seconds. Nobody needs to teach me anything. Key, you know, gas pedal will go. Yeah. Right? Uh, but if you gave me a, a V12, like Dodge Viper, and put me in the snow, dude, I'm dead. <laughs> you know, like, I won't even make it here. You'll never see me again. Uh, maybe even on uh, dry cement in the middle of the summer, Rainy I might not make it. Yeah. I mean, that car takes require, like, it is, you know, a high performance uh, vehicle that's capable of a lot of things that Ford Focus isn't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but man, not anybody can get in it. Uh, uh, it takes uh, some skill, you know, to drive it proper. So, <laughs> and, you know, uh, get advantages of what you bought. Uh, sure. Is there anything else in there? How much of a pH swing uh, is okay? All right, that's a good one too. Uh, so, I would say generally anytime that you're in between 7.8 and 8.3, nothing's you're, gonna die. You're gonna be fine. Yep. Uh, right between or at seven point or eight point three, it's almost certain that you're going to grow corals faster. Coralline algae is going to grow faster. Everything in the tank is probably going to be happier. Uh, but in the same breath, I mean, you're probably doing more to maintain those higher pHs, right? You're probably more equipment. You know, maybe a little more cost. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are things you're going to have to do in most cases to main, try to maintain that eight point three. So I'm going to say. Previous to maybe the last couple of years, mm -hmm. I told people stop worrying about pH. Yeah. Like you're more likely to screw your tank up chasing pH Mad than you are to improve yeah. the quality of anything in there. Mm. And I still say that's true for at least 50% of people. Right. Unless you're really dedicated, like I'm gonna solve my pH thing at all costs and I'm gonna do it forever. And I want the best, most awesome tank that grows the stuff the fastest. If that's you, then you can solve it. If that isn't you, and I'm going to give up on it in uh, eight months, you're more likely to screw things stay up. Stay in that range. Right? Yeah. Just, just stay in the side of 7.8, 8.3 won't be the reason that you failed, uh, <laughs> and you will have success. Now, if you uh, you know want the Dodge Viper, yeah, I can teach you how to drive that too. <laughs> so in in that case, man, the the two ways that you know the way that pre previously everybody did it was super duper uh, pH buffer deluxe uh, booster, dump you it know, in the tank. Uh, I'm gonna get in deluxe, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, and you know what it was is usually just alkalinity buffer of some sort. Right. So like soda ash or something maybe? Uh, it was probably bicarbonate, okay. you know, a lot of it. Probably not soda ash because that would raise your pH drastically. But right. like, you know, it may be a mix of the two even. Okay. But it's just temporary. And what are you doing at the same time? You're raising your alkalinity. Yeah. Right? Nobody's telling you that, that when you're buying it. They're just saying, hey, you're super be a pH It'll mixer do. deluxe here, fix your problem. It'll raise pH. Yeah, yeah, it raises the alkalinity, man. Like, if I'm dosing this every day to keep an 8.3, I'm gonna have an alkalinity of 2,000. Yeah. You know, like everything's <laughs> dead. You know, there's a surest fire way to screw up a tank is to use anything that's labeled pH buffer. Right. Like, Boost, alkalinity buffer. buffer for sure. Yeah. If it's labeled pH buffer, garbage. Uh, and the second one is actually stuff that includes borate in it, you know, so oh, yeah. borate will kind of, I don't want to say artificially, but for our purposes, artificially elevate the pH, okay. right? It'll kind of keep it higher by default. The problem is, is uh, a alkalinity test kit brings it up as total hardness, right? Okay. And so I may think I have eight DKH in my tank. And for the reef tank's purposes, the reason I measure DKH, one of the primary reasons is to find out how much carbonate's in the water, right? Because right? most of the alkalinity in there is uh, carbonate alkalinity. And I need calcium and I need carbonate to make calcium carbonate, which is the coral skeleton. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to measure how much is carbonate is in there. Well. If you're using a salt or a additive that adds borate to it, you know, what I'm gonna do is start adding, or especially if I'm adding enough borate to change the pH, I mm -hmm. should say. Uh, in that case, I'm just elevating the borate levels over and over and over again because the corals don't consume borate as fast as they do carbonate. But it shows any. up as carbonate. Yeah, so of my eight DKH, it could be four DKH of, of borate right. and four of carbonate. Which means my test kit tells me, hey, I'm doing awesome. Right. But in reality, man, I have half as much carbon as I should in the water. Hmm. So, like, pH uh, buffer deluxe, what is it? 
What, what is it? No, it's garbage. It, yeah. yeah, garbage. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> he gave it to me. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I, <laughs> even like to some degree distrust a company that's willing to sell that. Oh, you know, okay. to, like I need to get past that fact and find eight other things they really like about them, just to get past the fact that they're selling the pH buffer deluxe because I know that it, that is bad for the tank in almost every yeah, case. Yeah. All right. So the good ways to, to do that. So the two good ways: uh, refugium. Refugium does, yeah. yeah. So it sucks out all the carbon dioxide. Uh, you know, I find it does it even when the light's not on to some degree, just ambient light. If it's total blackout in the room, it won't. But uh, sucks out the uh, carbon dioxide, absolutely increases it. Most of the time, uh, people do it on reverse cycle. Yeah. Uh, removing excess CO2 from the ambient air. Can ah, open help. windows. Yeah. yeah. So it's hard to do though. Venting, yeah. Yeah, some people, like, uh, I found that just flipping a, a bathroom fan on uh, in my upstairs would chain, would suck out enough CO2 that I'd get the increase. So I didn't have mm -hmm. to open a window or anything. Worst case, I'm just drawing some kind of airflow through my heating system. No, it's Hopefully, pulling it out of your attic. Or pulling it out of my attic. <laughs> yeah, but when it's the wintertime, it's, it's fine. Uh, for that, it actually, uh, you know, uh, air exchangers in people's houses now. You know, mm. so, like... You know, most new houses these days come with an air exchanger installed. So you can, you know, uh, the one in my house has three settings, like almost never, intermediate, and always, mm. right? And so maybe you have your set on almost never. I uh, go ahead, turn it up to all, almost always, and uh, see if it changes the pH in your tank. If it does, maybe the increase at heating and cooling costs is worth it. I don't know. Depends huh. on how much that would be. Right. Uh, but the CO2 media uh, yeah, on the sure. skimmer, you That'll know. Do it. Uh, like that one works for me every time I've ever done it and like precisely especially mm. with a solenoid that opens and closes it yeah so like and that has no effect on the chemistry it just reduces the amount of co2 in the tank and reduces the uh, gas ex or increase the gas exchange and reduces the co2 in the tank so like for me that is the way I'd go and I haven't done it yet but what I really want to do is test the recirculating yeah. CO2 thing. Yeah, there's a uh, Jay Downs, I think his name is, on our Reef to Reef forum. He, uh, we had mentioned this a while ago, because right, as it's Sam, when we first started messing around with CO2 media, it was canister that draws ambient room air and through the CO2 media into the skimmer uh, intake, air intake, and then it just adds it to the tank. Uh, but the media would go semi-quick. Uh, we burn the like, media pretty fast. But what if you took the input line off that we used to just let draw from the ambient air and drilled a hole in the skimmer ca cup and put it inside the skimmer cup so now you're just recirculating its own air. Uh, Jay Downs, uh, uh, his screen name on Reef to Reef, he actually has a thread where he's testing this before us. But yeah, so, so far success. I think, yeah, from what I've read of it. but. Uh, really cool to test uh, right, out our own. For those of you who don't know, right now we're testing pH uh, on uh, four tanks in the back. Two of them are elevated at 8.3 and two are at 7.8. Uh, in the 7.8, we just add CO2, you know, with a solenoid. To keep it steady, yep. yeah. And then to the 8.3, we actually scrub, uh, scrub it mm -hmm. with the CO2 scrubber and a skimmer. So in, in that both that cases, when we're going to find out exactly, you know, how long or what the benefit is. We did this already, and we produced the results, and then two of them got turned orange for some reason. Yeah, I couldn't figure it out. Uh, Measurable results like weight, mass. Yeah, measure the weight. And, yeah, you know, visually, visually too. Visually growth. Yeah. Uh, but weight probably the most important component of it because it has actual meaning rather than looks bigger. <laughs> uh, and I'm I'm positive I can already tell you right now that we're going to see results in these ones and be able to show them to you. I you know it's been running like two months, so it might we're be worth checking there, there yeah. uh, and seeing if we can get to the results now. But uh, the next thing I'm going to add them do is. Uh, do the if we find the 8.3 does exactly what we thought it does, right. which drastically increases the consumption. I can tell you the consumption of uh, uh, the two part is is much much higher in that one as well. Right. Uh, and if that is the case, well, let's take it one step farther and do the recirculating skimmer versus non. We can test a does a skimmer actually still produce and do the thing that we want it to do, right? Or is it just a vehicle for gas exchange at that point, right? Uh, and two, like. Does Do the they, media last longer? Yeah, does the media last longer in that case? Like right. forever, right. almost, probably. Almost it, perpetual, yeah. Yeah, hmm. I mean, like it probably, instead of lasting weeks, would last months to most of the year, I'm guessing. Which is yeah. a which is a cost concern to some reefers because of the CO2 media is not, it's not, it's not cheap. 
But you know, one of the things though in that, in that you know, like I would love it if it was like, uh, you know, if you could if you could use it for six months instead of you know three weeks, right? Uh, it's a much more viable option, right? Right. And so, some people would probably say we're insane because like <laughs> people are buying it right now and consuming it every three weeks. Yeah. But like, I don't know, who wants to do that? So, like, let's let's try to get as long as we could possibly get yeah, out like of it capacity. and make it a viable option. Yeah. Yeah. Like GFO, high capacity versus not. I mean, it lasts a little longer. more, but yeah. a little bit. Uh, but in this case, it causes you the same, and we just get it ten times the use out of it. Right. So, right, right. Uh, I don't know, but like. Uh, what I'd really like to find out, man, is if we can find out how much, you know, like uh, extra growth. Like, if you're buying a frag that's 60 bucks and it goes from here to here in uh, three months, well, dude, you know, even though the media is 15 bucks a, a month or whatever, yeah. if it goes from here to here in that same period of time, I'm in. I mean, I'll pay the 15 bucks, man, because it, <laughs> it's this one times, you know, the other 80 frags that are in there. Yeah. And my Coraline LG coverage is protecting from uh, uh, other pests and stuff laying down. Uh, for sure. But I need to know that's actually doing something. Yeah. Yeah, like I don't want to, like, I don't want to do anything at all in the tank that don't know, like, what the results are. And I, I can't say anything because some of it's always a mystery. But if I do know, I'm in. Like, I'll, I will now do it, especially if it's easy and I can automate it. Yeah, for sure. All right. I, really, uh, I like this next topic. Let's do it. Let's do it. It's the uh, yeah that one. So this one uh, this one was really cool. Uh, it was one I got oh, yeah. engaged with pretty heavy too, and I think you and I had some different opinions I think on it. But uh, basically, Matt was wondering if it's wise for him to turn his calcium reactor off at night to help with pH. So we're kind of stemming off that last topic. I'm gonna let you answer, man. Um, I'm uh, you know, I've been doing all these tests uh, with the the affluent uh, concentrations and all this and you know as far we're, we're talking about stability we preach stability all the time and i think my answer my answer to matt was yeah it's probably not for me i wouldn't do it um because hmm. i'm thinking okay so calcium consumption rates and alkalinity and calcium consumption rates are increased during the day probably to some degree where they maybe they're not calcifying as much at night uh but there's a so the this to me i think there's this seems to be this ebb and flow uh, of alkalinity and calcium consumption rates. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. But on a, on a 24 hour timeline or you know a full day timeline, it balances out to be a certain consumption rate in 24 hours. In which case I've dialed my calcium reactor to match whatever that is in a 24 hour period. Uh, so when I start to flip the switch off at night, uh, maybe a, my levels of alkalinity and calcium start to fall because I'm not supplementing them and when I turn it back my calcium reactor back on in the morning uh, I'm now at a new alkalinity DKH that my calcium reactor set at so 8.5 before going to bed 8.3 when I wake up in the morning my calcium reactor is set to sustain whatever consumption rate it was so maybe it stays at 8.3 now I'm gonna steps okay. down but I don't know I'm gonna make Terrence super happy. Try it, try it. You know, like, uh, we can find out. We're gonna measure it by That's the true. hour all day long. That's great. Let's find out exactly what it is. It beats the uh, alternative, <clears throat> which is me sitting there taking a test every 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is my take on it, and and uh, like here's the thing: is like we're a lot of us are dosing two part. We're not dripping it one milliliter, you know, every minute. Like, actually, I guess if you have a dose, it actually can split it up over the whole day. Yeah, you, you know, can. By automatically. But, yeah. you know, if you don't have a dose, most people are sending it up, dose, you know, 30 milliliters three times a day or something. So it's, like, far from perfect. Right. You know, and, like, right, right. you might even be, do 100 milliliters right now in the morning, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, and so that's kind of, like, what it's doing. And most people believe that it's probably most of the calcifications happening while the lights are on and it's producing energy. Right. We really know that, you know, for sure. Right. But, like, I think most people believe that. Uh, so this was my take on it. Like, one of the downsides of uh, 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 a calcium reactor is that it will presumably reduce the pH to some degree because you're low, you know, dosing a small amount of low pH solution. Oh, yeah, yeah. I will tell you how, do, how big of a, you know, degree that happens in your tank is largely how you set it up. Your, you know? your flow rate, more or less? Yeah, probably if you set it up optimally, uh, it will uh, not do that. I saw another guy who said I couldn't get my pH over 7.5, and it was because he had uh, a, a pH inside of it at 6.2, and he had it at an open flow rate, and like, 
Yeah, that doesn't sound good, dude. Yeah. Yeah, uh, like that's probably why your problem, like you're having a problem. So, like after we're done with your series where we look into the flow rates and strengths and stuff, and we give some direct suggestions, I don't think it's going to be an issue. Yeah. But this is where uh, I, I believe it's going to be the same. So what we can do inside the reactor is create a you know stable concentration, like 20 dKH is coming out of the effluent, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I now have a 20 day dKH. It's just like two part, except for weaker. It's just how much of it am I going to dose of that 20 dKH solution in a day? Right. And so you know if I'm going at uh, uh, 20 milliliters a minute, well, there's no reason you know that I couldn't half that and only do it 12 hours a day mm -hmm. and do it at 40 milliliters a minute okay. and maintain that same 20 dKH. And maybe it's not as stable as running it all day long, mm -hmm. but it might be that actually during the day is when it's being consumed, so it actually makes more sense to add more of it during the time that it's actually being consumed rather than add it at night. Yeah. Try it in. Try it in. Well, no. <laughs> so, like, uh, you know, for me, that that's probably the big thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, actually, uh, where I first heard that was actually from Terrence because he was using the dose to run his calcium reactor. Mm -hmm because it was like one of the few options that you know had a reliable pump but that thing only is an on off cycle of you know on one one third off two thirds right and so, so like you could only run it so much time so he's just like dude i, I only run it one third and i just run it faster mm -hmm. you know and like oh well i don't know that i guess sense. there's no reason it doesn't have to run constantly right so okay. yeah i don't know bravo man huh. uh i'm trying to think of any other reasons you would do it that way ah you know what you might actually do it opposite you might only dose at night with the calcium reactor and feed it into your refugium. If yeah, yeah, because the refugium is going to scrub it all out for sure. For sure. Well, and that's a, that leads into some more testing that we were talking about. So, I mean, basically with the calcium reactor testing, we're doing you know flow rates, we're doing different pHs, we're doing trace elements or not, we're doing you know di maybe different types of medias and things like that. Uh, but we're also, I think we we're also talking about looking at how to reduce the, the CO2 uh, impact uh, or the pH impact from a calcium reactor. I think mm -hmm. we talked about like feeding into a skimmer, feeding into a refugium, feeding it somewhere else, running it through another chamber if that actually works or not. Mm -hmm. so, I think uh, we'll definitely find a way that minimizes that effect to uh, where it doesn't. To, like, doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of them might be. You know, only turn it on for a period of time, turn it faster. The only downside to that is your pump is running twice as fast, which makes it a lot louder, you True. know, in some cases yeah, anyway. Right. So uh, depending on how loud you're willing to have your pump, uh, that would definitely change it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, what else was in that? Is there anything else inside that question, or is that it? Uh, that was it inside that question. It's a pretty big one. I mean, we're going on 45 comments and multiple replies that don't get counted towards the main comment count. So hmm. uh, it's a pretty good oh, topic yeah, of discussion in there. Yep. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Boom. So this is my testing station for the calcium reactor test. That's a 60-gallon tank on the left that holds uh, Tropic Marin Pro water. Uh, and then if, and it's active. This is a live shot, too, by the way. And uh, yeah, we've got uh, the Vertex calcium reactor, some reborn media from Two Little Fishies, and I'm running uh, the Camor dosing pump, and here's yeah. Ryan live. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we're in there testing, uh, testing away. Hey, uh, so far from, I've only tested one pH point for the flow rate and how it affects it. Mm -hmm. A little inside baseball for you guys watching. Uh, didn't do very much. From I don't know. Like from 20, the difference between 20 mils a minute to 100 mils a minute, which is pretty drastic, you think? 6.4 didn't do too much. So it'll be super interesting at 6.8 too. But yeah, like for sure. One of those things you hear about calcium reactors all the time is uh, I can change the concentration with the pH, you know, but I can get it stable. But once I change the flow rate to match, now the CO2 is going to change, and I change the CO2 and it changes this, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So it might not be true. Yeah, I, well, it's certainly not, not to true the degree, at, at yeah that at, people think it is. Yeah, so at, at like I'm just gonna give it away. Yeah, at, at this 6. one 4? level. Yeah, six point four. Uh, we had a uh, DKH. Yeah, the max saturation DKH at six point four was a very very flow, small flow rate. It was yeah, like five forty. Mils. Yeah, it was like forty DKH. That was forty max DKH. saturation. What was like we're gonna rank it up four times the flow rate 20. at uh, twenty milliliters a minute. What was the DKH? Twenty mils a minute. The DKH was like thirty nine point seven. So it drops nothing. zero <laughs> through point three. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then at uh, 40. forty, we're now at uh, eight times. Was, yeah, which ended up being like thirty seven and some change. If I think not it was 30, like 30, 38. thirty eight. Yeah, yep. I think thirty eight and some change. So really, again, nothing. I'm gonna spare the drama. Get all the way down to a hundred milliliters. What was it? 
36.8 or 36.9 yeah. or something like so that. Difference in concentration between... A uh, DKH and a half or almost. A D or or I think it was two and a half. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Two and a half DK DKH between five milliliters a minute and 100. That's insane. So I basically that tells me... Uh, if all I got to do is like, hey, uh, I need more of this high potent DKH solution. It's like having two part in the back of my tank. I know what concentration right my two part part is, and my alk's not keeping up. I'll just add more mills. I'll dose more mills in a single day. Same yeah. thing with this. So it's reliant on making sure your pH probe is well maintained yeah, and it's maintaining the right pH inside the solution. We're not necessarily counting bubbles at that point. No. We are uh, maintaining the pH using a reliable tool, right? Yeah. Maybe even a backup on the fluent, but mm -hmm. like. In that case, man, like this is so, so easy. Now that is at 6.4, so we're gonna go all the way up to, we're gonna measure it at 6.8, 6 right? And if at 6.8, it's the same story, we're not even gonna bother to go to 6.6. Yeah. But if it isn't, uh, and uh, at, at 6.8, it, it melts lower. You can actually slower, see some differences, yeah. We'll go to 6.6 and give you the window. Yeah, Yeah. I'm pretty so excited about that one. I think this is, like the goal here is definitely to be able to tell you, if you have X tank, just set the thing at this pH and turn it to whatever and up and down within that range. Because like right now, there's just so much crappy advice. You know, I mean, the <laughs> advice is good, but it's just so wishy-washy and non-committal. And confusing. Yeah, and wow. confusing, like you know, somewhere in between 6.2 and 7.2, bubble rates or something like that. You yeah. can make it a little bit bigger, smaller, blah, blah, blah. Like, but it doesn't really help me, man. It just gives me into a window of like, ah, uh, that sounds too hard. Well, you know, for most people, it's just too much, you know? That's like, well, if, from the last test that we did, uh, that, we did uh, that I put out, I mean, if, if you have a fixed flow rate and you just, you're trying to adjust your calcium reactor to consumption based on pH set points, it's a it's a swing. Like yeah. you're talking about the difference of six to upwards of nine dkh between set points. Yeah, it's pretty big. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. For the goal anyway, can't guarantee we'll achieve it. But the goal is going to be set this reactor up this way, turn these dials to this, and be happy. We're done. Yeah. yeah I mean, I I mean, we probably won't get all the way to that, but we'll be pretty hopefully close. like pretty close, man. Uh, like ideally, for me, I would like to see this get so close that. One could argue this is easier than two part, yeah, and that's a big challenge. We're definitely, if anything, uh, if, if we don't get to that point, we're definitely chipping away at the learning curve involved of a calcium reactor, which people think is, is pretty extensive. And at some point in time, it was like when I first started learning about calcium reactors, I, my eyes went cross several times, but I finally figured out, you know, the relationship of what's happening here, and mm -hmm. we just make this easier. You know. Well, so one of the things that we tested this week was, or last week was the you know max concentration mm -hmm. at each one of those set points. And so if you haven't seen it, go go check it out. Mm -hmm. But like at a pH of seven, you know the water going into it's just like Tropic Marin Pro, which was like seven dKH, mm -hmm. right? And then at a pH of seven inside the reactor, it produces like twelve dKH. You know, and then at a pH of all the way on the other end of six point two, it was like fifty, 50. dKH. Mm -hmm. One of the things I wanted to get to, and you know, maybe some people already knew this or, or not, but I wanted to definitively show it and add numbers to it, mm -hmm. was does the media just melt faster as you get down in the pH? Or does each pH have its own max concentration? And what we were able to confirm uh, for uses inside of a reactor anyway, yeah. and the flow rates that would be common to what you're gonna use it for, is each pH did have a max saturation, meaning it won't get, in a high, get any higher than that regardless of how long you run it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can increase the saturation. It'll probably also increase the speed at which it melts, but not just endlessly. Right. So, uh, you know, we can get some expectations, you know? So mm -hmm. if I have a LPS or a mixed tank, maybe I want to set it to, uh, you know, 6.8 and have a DKH of 20, mm -hmm. right? And you know they have a little bit more uh, wind, uh, leeway in my window there. But if I have an SPS tank, we can give a direct recommendation, set it at 6.5 or whatnot, and then you know have a very fixed uh, higher concentration. And also, you can give you you know a, a better window into well, you know what I don't want my pump running as fast as it is. Yeah. So I'll use a higher concentration yeah. solution yeah. and dose less. Mm -hmm. you that know? makes sense. So like, uh, especially if I have like a dose or something where I don't want that ring running all the time. Yeah, you know? so hope may maybe what we'll find from this too is is that just that, that you, uh, you know, there's different types of pumps you can use with this uh, with this whole situation. If you've got the, an extra dose heads in there, you could probably throw one on here. You know, we'll figure something out where 
you can use a uh, shorter term, you know, dosing pump and use, achieve the same result. Presumably, like one of the things, you know, big big change for our calcium reactors was that Camor pump, the continuous the duty, F yeah. FX STP or mm -hmm. something, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but continuous duty, it spins all the time. We can control it. It lasts a long time. But I mean, it's, how long has it been on the market now? Like uh, nine months, maybe. Yeah, somewhere around there. Uh -huh. So, like continuous duty, we don't know. You know, uh, so I haven't far? seen a lot of complaints about it. Yeah. So, like, but it's new to the market, so we'll find out how long it really lasts at, at continuous duty. But I can tell you this: it's pro the tubing and pump head and gears and everything are probably going to last four times as long if it's spinning one fourth the speed. Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So if I can go, uh, if I can make an intelligent decision now, like, hey, man, I want to pin this thing at uh, six point five for that reason. I want my pumps to last longer, my right. equipment to last longer. Yeah. Nope. Anyway, we're gonna blow the cap off a of calcium <laughs> reactor. It might not be applicable to everybody out there listening because they're using two par or whatever. But it's important to me uh, that uh, anybody can sell a calcium reactor. Like, I want to be, uh, you know, part of the group of people that helps make it easier and more successful. So help you get the right things that you want so mm -hmm. you can be successful. And then after you get it, help make sure that your tank is a success uh, using it, which is quite different than just selling it. Yeah, true. So even though it's not hitting everybody out there, for the people that are buying them, I think they deserve that respect. And so we're on it. All right. For sure. Let's hit another cool. one. Uh, uh, it's, it is 4.05, so... I uh, did promise in the title and description that we would hit this GFO one, so okay, we should it. probably hit that GFO one. In which case, uh, he's just showing his hand a checker. This is Adrian, and he was using Roafos uh, for the first time, so he's using a GFO. And his uh, phosphate red 0.11 on Saturday, before you install the reactor, how long does he have... Uh, how long before he changes it is really what his question is. Mm. And I... I think a lot of the answer here was hey, when somebody had answered pretty, uh, somebody had answered smart here and said test the effluent coming out or test the water coming out of the GFO reactor and if it matches whatever your tank is, the, so if there's registered phosphates or what have you in the tank water and coming out of the reactor uh, output is the same, then the GFO is probably exhausted. Completed. Yeah. yeah. That's a good. That's a good point. Uh, so I just say in general, when my levels started to rise in my tank, the GFO is exhausted. Yeah. Right? Like this stuff isn't rocket science, so I don't have to like know it's working, like uh, prove that yeah. the actual like that definitely proves that it's working. Right. right? But uh, you know, it's like known science. This stuff is super simple. So uh, if the tank is rising in uh, uh, phosphate. I think it's exhausted. Right? And it's most likely not going to be this massive catastrophic type change where one day a light switch flips and the GFO is gone, done, yep. and now you've got a problem with your tank. It's going to be gradual. It's going to be noticeable. Yeah, so. but definitely what you just decided, said, man, if you test the effluent and it's uh, not lower than the tank, it's time to throw it out. Time to throw it out. And one of the things about it is, is like it, it's not 100% efficient, right? So like, not necessarily mm -hmm. all the water at the flow rate that you pick is going to strip it clean for sure right. and especially as the stuff ages and the pores get filled with uh, bacteria mm. you know film and whatnot and so like it's it but the thing about it is, it is it has you know probably hundreds of times a day so it's not like a single pass filter where it gets one shot at removing it right you know the whole tank is going through this thing you know many 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 times a day so it doesn't need to have uh, you know, 100% efficiency. Mm -hmm. But if it is not lower coming out than it is in, it's probably done. And one of the things that like people, you know, really miss in this stuff, and so they say like, hey man, I depleted my GFO inside of days or whatever, why isn't it working? Well, so there is a vast chasm of difference between the person that's throwing some food in every day and you're maintaining these new low, fee, uh, you know, uh, phosphate levels in your tank. And you know, you're at, you know, point, you know, 0 0.1 or something or yeah. 0 0.03 or wherever you know a lot of people try to shoot for with gfo right is you know down there man like maintaining that no level no problem uh -huh. but like if i'm starting with a you know like phosphate level of two yeah you might deplete it really fast yeah you, you know could. just trying to get it down yeah. to begin with and often it's been my experience that Rather than try to use chemicals to solve really bad problems like mm. two, yeah. you know, or whatever, <laughs> uh, I would just do water changes. Which is going to yeah. gradually bring it down because of dilution. Dilution, yeah. 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 So if I did a 50% water changes or, or two, uh, like 30% water changes or whatever, I'd probably bring the, you know, the two, two to one, two. Mm -hmm. to half, yeah. to whatever. 
Uh, and so instead of just trying to, this thing is just going to strip it all out pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. And you're probably going to deplete it. It's probably going to be expensive. Uh, so I, I might not go take that route to it. Yeah, for sure. All right. Awesome, man. Is there any more in here you want to hit? Uh, maybe, yeah, that one. Uh, yep. So the last ah, one. There you uh, go. Which I also promised. No, no, no. Oh, the, the, uh, yep, there you go. Where is it? That one. This yes. one. All right. Hey. This is what we promised. <laughs> this is what right. I promised in the title also. Uh, in case you didn't catch the front end in the back end, we're giving away $5,000 in salt. Uh, that's 60 buckets of salt to 60 winners, uh, one each. I yeah. still can't believe it came down to 5K because, like, uh, when I said 3K, we almost threw up. I know. And uh, like, Added another 30 at the end buckets. Of the day, man, like, <laughs> well, if you're already in it for three, you might as well go for five I and mean, make one. it fun. That's I a big know. one. I don't know. We gave away... Um, a donated gem tank that's like thousand dollars, five a thousand five hundred dollars. Well, you know what it is. I like bit. things like have round sounding numbers. Oh yeah. Yeah. So thirty buckets of salt and like uh, and five thousand dollars in salt. <laughs> I'm like I don't know, man. I think the community deserves it. Let's do it. Yeah, for yeah, sure. I don't know. They support us. So, yeah, so uh, if you guys haven't uh, if you guys haven't found out yet, uh, you can either go to our website, click on the link, free stuff at the top of the page. It will show you uh, uh, the picture you just saw for the five K giveaway. And uh, it'll take you over to our hashtag SBRS TV group. So we gained uh, oh, from I think we went from eight thousand when we first we were starting this competition or this uh, giveaway mm -hmm. to now we're like a ten and a half or more. Yeah, a couple and, thousand people uh, join. So all you got to do, yeah, join and uh, like and comment on the post that that has the giveaway. And then also, you know, while you're there, answer some reefing questions or ask some reefing questions because that's basically what the whole thing is about. Get in there and get your questions asked. Or Adam, man. I know. Uh, uh, like uh, that poor guy, he's got so many questions uh, coming in at him. Like, uh, I tried to help this weekend. Uh, I jumped in. I think I probably, I probably answered maybe, I don't know, 60, 70 questions yeah. this weekend. So, I mean, I'm, my wife hates me, boy, <laughs> but I don't care. I got to do what I got to do. Uh, all right, all right. Oh, we're up to eleven thousand members already. Pretty oh, cool. Almost, almost, almost eleven thousand. Get in today. there, yeah. Give us a push. All right. Yeah, well, you didn't believe we we're going to get to eleven thousand on Friday, yeah, man. Yeah, you know, I, I was a sore loser on that one. I'll, yeah. What we should have bet a dollar. Yeah, sour face. All right, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we're going to Thursday, man. New goal, twelve, I think. Yeah. You know, I don't know, whatever it is. Yeah. So we'll draw on Friday morning, and we'll let everybody know. All right. Well, thanks for Brightwell taking part and yeah, uh, Tropic sure. Marin. For and sure. good luck on winning some salt, everybody. All right. Yeah. See Take you soon. care, guys. Mm.